The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay. So um, we're going to talk today about uh, APIs, and we're going to talk today about the cheap part of APIs. This is not as usual with any of my talks. I'm not going to give you any sort of amazing revelations. You're not going to walk out of here with a, oh my god, I didn't know any of these things. This is actually probably crap you already know just like every time I ever speak. But if you don't know something that I say, you should be deeply, deeply embarrassed and don't come up and tell me later. So. Uh, as with yesterday, I am Michael Alvis. I am a DevOps consultant, and I am probably not a shape-shifting, mind-controlling lizard man. Um, that link is live. When they upload this, you have to go see those people. They're hilarious. I am lawful evil neutral tendencies. I am a kind of a bitch. So I don't like the idea of people telling me what to do, but I love telling other people what to do. So if you're also like me, then this is going to be terrible for you. This is my Twitter handle, my blog. Uh, they are becoming more useful, I suppose, as time goes by. Um, you are the other kind. You are almost certainly a developer if you are interested in this at all or have any interest in this kind of idea. But you might be in operations because APIs live in practically every part of what we do. You probably write code of some sort, but it might be uh, shell scripts. I was going to say bullshit shell scripts, but I'm going to mean that. Uh, you might even document some of that, but you probably don't. Um, you probably don't document stuff because it's sort of not what you do for a living, but that's okay. You might also realize that your code is typically kind of hard to deal with, but you also probably don't because you wrote it. It was pretty easy for you. Now, um, People, we have, there's an enormous amount of code in the world that's available for us for, in a variety of ways. We use a lot of it every day. Um, who in here is fairly proficient with SED? Okay. Who in here believes SED has an API? Everything has an API. So if you use SED, then you use something that has an API. If you've become proficient with the SED API, specifically if you've come, become proficient with whatever version of regex is working with your version of SED, then you have a specific iteration of that API that you are good with. You're probably really annoyed with all other iterations that don't work the way that yours do. And this sort of thing is how we get work done. We don't do it all ourselves. There's a pile of other stuff in the world. If you just go look in search.maven.org, there are tens of thousands of Java libraries, just Java, just the uh, evil, evil Java, that people have written and provided for other people to use. They get used all over the place. About 75% of those suck. I mean, they just do. The 75% that don't suck are the ones that, are been that have been replacing the ones that do most of the time, but that's not always true. We want to use your code. As developers, we would like to use your code. We really want to use your code because we don't want to do whatever stupid crap it is that you spent the time working on to, so that we don't, to do what, that task as we want to do it. We really, really want to use your code because we're lazy. And we find it incredibly effing hard to use your code. I know this is a big revelation for a lot of people, but it is super, super hard to use most other people's code. I mean, I'm not talking about like how to use system.out in Java or how to do print line in a, in a thousand other scripting languages or whatever. I'm talking about how to use, you know, I swore I wouldn't call anybody out on this, but has anybody in here used OAuth? The OAuth? authorization mechanism. Was it fun the first time you did it? Is it fun the 15th time you tried to make it work? Hell no, it's not. It's hard to use. Is OAuth a really good authorization mechanism? Damn right it is. But it's hard to use. And did it need to be hard to use? No, it didn't need to be hard to use. No, it didn't. It didn't need to be. OK, it was going to be hard to, to use. But it didn't need to be. That's not the, those two things aren't the same thing. You know, it was inevitable that it was going to be hard to use. But it, is, it doesn't need to be. All I want to do is take some credential, pass it to some system, have that thing tell me to piss off because I'm not an actual user, or 
log me in and let me see my porn or whatever it was I was going to watch. I don't really, because I'm not really a porn guy. But. Okay. <laughs> the other problem is, is that when, P you, when your hard, hard, hard to use API comes up, you're not very helpful at fixing that problem. I know you guys, all everybody in here, y'all are not like that. I totally get that. You showed up at self. You self-selected to come to self. You are kind of here because you know a lot of things go awry when it comes to these things. I'm talking to you guys. The people that we're recording for, the people who are out there going, I didn't make it to self, but that's okay because I know everything there is to know about doing everything ever. You're not very helpful. You don't give me good advice. You don't give me easy to use applications. You don't give me easy to use interfaces. You don't give me easy to use REST APIs. For God's sake, that ought to be the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's not. Has anybody here ever used, no, I can't use that. I actually still have a relationship with them. I'm gonna go ahead and skip that. <laughs> For most developers, this is what you see. You wrote this thing and you're like, this is awesome. Look how awesome it is. The people that Mark were talking about a minute ago who did write the OAuth uh, API probably think OAuth looks like this. They probably go, what's your problem? You're just not smart enough to use OAuth. <laughs> well, maybe I'm not. I'm a, I'm a relatively bright guy, at least I think I am. But maybe I'm not smart enough to use your incredibly complicated system. Maybe I'm not. I'm okay. But to me, it looks a hell of a lot more like this. Does anybody see what's on the other side of that right there? I know what it is because I actually stole this picture from the internet. But can you tell what's through that window? No, of course you can't. <laughs> it, I think it's a bridge, by the way. But I'm not 100% sure. I think it's got a lot of graffiti on it. But your software is a filthy, filthy window into, your API is a ridiculously filthy window into your software. It is how we see inside your stuff. I don't care what the heck is going on behind there. I don't care. As long as it doesn't bleed crap all over the rest of my stuff, I don't care what your application does, what your library does, what your you know, widget does. I don't care. I just want it to do what I want it to do, the thing you told me it would do. I'll bet it does that. I'll bet your software actually works. I know for a fact OAuth works. I know it does because I've made it work. But afterwards, I took a shower. And, and it wasn't just because I felt dirty, it's because I had worked up a sweat. So when you, when you give me a thing to use, try to make it so that I can see inside a little bit. Or at least so that the, the communication isn't through some, you know, like some slot where a guy opens up and goes, oh, you got the password. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> Bruno sent me. I don't want to have to tell OAuth that Bruno sent me. Because that's... That's, that's, that's actually disabling me. That's not enabling me, that's disabling me. Now, APIs come in many, many types, many flavors. We're all familiar with most of these things, or if you're not, that's okay, because it doesn't really matter. They're all the same. REST, so, the SOA web type APIs, there's, they produce services. Almost all of these talk at some service level. They, have a, they either have a port they talk on, or they, you have a localized protocol that you deal with, something along those lines. There's also code interfaces. There's the, the, the libraries of the world, the, the Java interfaces, the Ruby de definitions, or whatever you want to call them, I guess. Ruby doesn't really have interfaces, I guess, but, having, but, but what em ends up being duct type capable applications. Things where you know what you can talk, how you can talk to a piece of software. They've, it's been published. And, then, and that's the API for that thing, whatever it might be. There's also command line interfaces that are, in fact, APIs. As I said, said everything has an API. The, the switches and the, the inputs. Linux, the Unix world's been handling this pretty well for a while. There's also a DSL. A DSL is generally, is generally not considered to be an API. But in the end, it's the way you drive a piece of code in the back end. So you can kind of think of it like an API because that's how you talk to that thing. Services in the world typically have a stable endpoint, somewhere that you know how to talk to them. If you're, um, what's, what's the, <laughs> this is embarrassing, what's the port that MySQL talks on most of the time? 3306. 3306, yeah, I think that's it. So when, you talk to, when you're talking to MySQL as a service, you, you, you know the host, you know where it's running, hopefully you know where it's running, 
And you talk on, your, your client talks on port 3306 and everybody's happy, right? You, have a, you, you almost never write network code to 3306 to drive MySQL. Why do you not do that? Because it's an atrocious protocol. They literally have to provide you a client to talk to you. Now, this is not, this is not unusual. Like, when your application is super, super complicated, you need something to mitigate for you, right? So you go, all right, well, there, there's that API. All right, one step further, here's the API I use for whatever I'm doing, right? So if you've got a, let's say you're using MySQL as your database, you use some sort of MySQL uh, driver on your side to mitigate a lot of that. But then that MySQL driver has a bunch of stuff on the front side of it that is the API that you're physically now using to talk to the database server. Now, the MySQL database drivers that I've used are not terrible. I mean, it's, you, you really can't screw them up that bad. I mean, it's, database drivers are a pretty, they're a pretty common lot. Um, Richard looks pretty much exactly like everybody else's. You connect to the database, you execute some query, you get some result, you parse through that result, the end. Update CRUD, you know, the CRUD work you do. That, yeah, that's a different story, right? <laughs> so, but they, have, they typically live in the world with, an, with, a, with a stable endpoint. But they often are, often surfaces, 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 often services have multiple versions running at the same time, especially if you're in a SOA world, where there might be some back-end service, some REST service, that I published at version 1.0 that has some degree of functionality, but then I published it at version 1.3 that has some different functionality. And which one am I talking to? Well, there's a, you know, you can have it be a stable endpoint where there's the 1.0 lives at this port and the 1.3 lives at this port or whatever. Or you can have it be at the same endpoint and just tell it which one you want to talk to. That sort of, that, that sort of instability in the background behavior is very common in a number of services. It might not be in your world, but it's actually super common in mine because I have, frequently have to deal with people who do rolling deployments. And so when you release version 2.5 and there's still a version 1.8 living in, in production. You just have to live with that. And, it, and everybody's going to be talking on the same port, so that you've got to have a way to figure out how to, talk to, how to talk to everybody at the same time. You might do it by having different endpoints or internal routing protocols, but probably what you do, probably what you do is you just rip up the old one and stick the new one in place. You probably do that. And when you do that, what you've done is you've broken the contract you had with whoever is using the old API. If, if 1.8 is not compatible with 2. whatever, then you have now broken the utility of the people who were using 1.8. You just snatched the rug out from under them. Now, has anybody in here ever done that? Of course you have. I did it last week. I, I did a lot of weird stuff last week, come to think of it. I did a lot of really evil stuff last week. But I've done it, I do it over and over again. Because sometimes you don't, aren't given a choice. I'm not saying that you do these things because you're evil. I'm saying you do them because you're either lazy or you have more stuff to do that you can't really fit all the things in, in place. Now with libraries, libraries are codes. The, they are, they, you deal with them with API variants by deprecation usually. I have a, an a, I've released version 1.8 of a thing. I have now released version 1.9 of a thing that is deprecating stuff that happened in 1.5. A deprecation is generally an indicator that says, hey, if you're depending on this, as of right now, I might take this away from you in the future. You should probably get off of it. And that's a, that's a fairly common behavior for APIs and libraries. Um, besides the deprecation mechanism, pretty much wide open. They can do, they, they, you, can do anything you want to people inside your code base. Now, with applications, the API is generally the set of commands and switches that you can do. Um, Git uh, is one of my favorite examples of this. Git has a huge number of sub-commands that you execute outside of the, in the Git environment. And then an enormous number of switches that can pretty much all be turned off with the word no in front of them. And as long as you know what that is, you kind of know what the API of it all is, the incredibly complicated API, yes, I'm talking to you, dude, the, the incredibly complicated API associated with dealing with Git at the command line, as long as you can do this, you can use the tool the way that it's meant to be used. But, and the, the Unix world almost always gets the, the command line API thing right. 
Historically, we have almost always gotten it right, where we said, all right, most things write stuff to standard out, and they dump their errors to standard error, and they take from standard in, and so you can pipe stuff left and right. We are, we're used to that. We've been doing it for decades now, I guess. Well, then, except for the people that, that don't do it anymore. Except for folks who go, no, 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 no. Unix is just the environment I run in, and everything else can suck it. So in domain-specific languages, this is a, it's like a language to drive an API. You, you, have, you, you give it commands. And like a, a, a database driver is almost exactly the same way. A database driver is a bit of, is a, bit of a way to t think about an, uh, a DSL to interact with the back-end service. I'm giving you a set of commands that are written in this very specific language, and you will parse those commands, and you will do a thing for me. Thank you for doing that thing for me. And of course, there are many, many ways to implement domain-specific languages. But most of the time, what they do is they drive an API. It's really just a smart wrapper around the API. It's generally a super smart wrapper, because it's meant to be a mechanism by which less skilled people can actually use your probably incredibly complicated API. There's nothing on the third point. Now, there are ways to fix this problem. There are mechanisms by which you can improve the way that your API works with the world. I'm not going to tell you that I know all of them. But these are definitely some of them. Like I said, this is the cheap seats. So one of the ways that you can improve an API is by documenting your API better. If anybody in here has not worked with an API recently that they went, this documentation blows. If you have not worked with at least one recently, then you probably have a pretty homogenous environment that you've had for a while. Because at some point along the way, you'll be like, dun, 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 dun. what the heck? Well, I wonder how I use this. Internet, 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 internet. Huh, that's all the documentation there is, huh? Java docs, awesome. Auto-generated Java docs, super awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, at least it tells me the 400 methods I might call on this factory object. How do I get the factory object? Well, that says factory, so maybe I call some you know, static method on, oh, no, that's not what happens. Hmm. Yeah, the factory factory. Or, or better yet, you just go, right, you go by the author's book, which was really the mechanism here, right? There's a, it was a whole, the whole idea was to drive you toward purchasing a piece of, uh, a piece of documentation. That part, I'm totally cool with. If you write an awesome book about your crappily documented API, well, I'll, I'll feel angry, but I'll get what I want. At least you've done good documentation. If you version your API well, then as I said yesterday, you're not an asshole. But if you don't, you're kind of an asshole. And you need a way to deter for people to determine what your versions mean. What is the version after 1.5? I don't know. It might be. Yeah, <laughs> unless it's Java and then it's 5 or 6, sorry. But anyway, but you don't know what the version after 1.5 is. Because the version after, after 1.5, ne the version needs to mean something. You need to have some meaning behind that version. It needs, I need to be able to look at your, your software, you know, a piece of code X version 5.4.1. And, and by my definition of the way good versioning works, if you have 5.4, if I'm using 5.4.1, I ought to be able to use 5.4.2 and not even think about it. And 5.4.74 and not even think about it. And I might have to think a little bit about using 5.5.0 I really shouldn't have to. And I really just shouldn't even consider 6.0.0 because you've told me, by my rules of versioning, that you're no longer compatible with the one I've been using. And if you don't do that, then you've just pulled a number out of your nether regions and slapped it on the end of your application and said, this is version 1.4.762. Well, that was the one after 761, by the way. But you just, it's, random, it's a random number. Effectively speaking, it's a random but increasing number. So at the very least, I can generally guess that 1.4.762 is after 761, but is it after 1.5.1? Mm hmm, how would I know? You might have been releasing two branches at the same time. 
composition of your API, especially with a library, is a huge deal. Now, um, I'll talk more about this when we get down to that. But examples of how your API works, kiss my ass, hello world. Who has ever written real software with a hello world example? Ever. Real, oh, stop it, Richard. <laughs> okay, I probably believe you might have, actually. But when you, when you get something complex and somebody gives you this sort of superficial use case that, is, that takes you three minutes to get un underway, yeah, okay, I get it. You have to show me what, how to get it all cranked up. But then if you're on, let's say, for instance, we're talking about OAuth again. I, I'm sorry, guys, sorry. But let's say we're talking about that. The, the base example for OAuth works just fine. And the second example works just fine. But when you try to tie it into your software, things get a little tougher. Now, for documentation, we know you hate writing documentation. Everybody hates writing documentation, except for people who are writers. My girlfriend is a writer. And she hates writing documentation. But people who write for a living generally go, oh, of course, da, 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 da. And all the rest of us are like, dude, documentation. I work with some people, not right now, who use the Agile process as, I would call it, a reason not to write documentation. We're Agile. We don't have to write documentation. Huh. OK. You're, you, oh, I get, yeah, sure. You keep writing the check, dog. But that doesn't necessarily mean I agree with them. But if your application doesn't require documentation, it's probably pretty lame. Or it's so awesome that it does everything for you by thinking for you. And if you have either one of those things, you don't really belong in this conversation. And I wish I was you, sort of. Versioning, we're, yeah, we already did this. Versions help you understand compatibility. Version, you need to use some comprehensible versioning scheme. And you need to tell people what it is. You really do. You need to tell people what your versioning scheme really means. It doesn't have to be the one I like, although the one I like is mathematically superior to all other ones. But you don't have to use mine. Just tell me how yours works. Oh, you don't know how to make yours work? Stop making shit up. It's not cool. When you, when you make stuff up like that, I, get, I start trusting you less. And I don't know you. I downloaded your software from the internet. As far as I know, you're a hacker attempting to acquire all my, all my stuff. And I don't want to have to trust you any more than, than, than I really, than I'm required to. I think I'm done with that. All right, back to composition. This, <laughs> okay, there's a couple of bad ways to do composition. You, you make a few calls, you get a few factories, you perform some really hinky stuff with those factories, you do, you know, you reach around your back, you're trying to scratch your left side with your right hand, that kind of thing. That's a form of composition. I go get a thing, I get a thing from that thing, and I kind of compose my run through your API by means of the mechanisms you have provided for me. Who writes their software this way? By the way, I do too, sometimes. So yeah, we do. I mean, this is why I hate developers, but okay, I'll go with that. Yeah, the, the Java developers, actually Java developers have had a pretty bad rap in this area because for a long time Java developers didn't understand this one really simple trick that makes composition super easy, which is returning self to all, almost all your stuff so that somebody can call, call, dot, call, dot, call, dot, call. When I have to write 14 calls to your, uh, to your API, and I have to get a result to each one, and then do something to it to get the next call, that's super annoying. Well, generally what happens for me is I get lost when, you're, when your API requires me to wander down the yellow brick road and never make it to the Emerald City. Now, there is a less bad way, which is basically that you're, the, you define the end results for what you want, for the, for the business proposition for your software. Now, your software might be image management, or you might be playing video games or whatever. That's still your business proposition. Defining the result you want your software to provide 
and then giving somebody the shortest route to that software, to that piece of the code that does the thing that they want done. Getting them to your business proposition as fast as possible is substantially less painful than the standard you know, 17 factories and, and 44 calls mechanism. And I still want to be able to walk the very detailed path when you do that. I want, if, if, it was a, if this was a question about, about a, a particular behavior that required 50 steps of orchestration in the back end, I'll, I'll be happy to front load a huge call. If you need 50 pieces of data from me, knock it out. I will give you all of them. If I can give you all of them and you immediately give me my result back, I don't care what happens back there. I mean, I do, but I don't care as long as I can, get, I can do the thing as simply as it can be done. Now, do I want to walk down the list that inquires each one of those 50 things and does all the steps in the back end? I probably don't want to, but eventually I'm going to have a use case that requires that I do. That I have a, I have a weird use case that requires that I skip a step or add another step or do something else in the middle or use some piece of information that you give me to, do it, to make a decision. But usually there are a number of places, there are a number of, of application uh, APIs that provide only the steps, not the end result. Obviously they give you something because people still use them, but they don't give you the thing in a tidy package. I am not saying that you shouldn't have to work for a living. I, I do not mean that. I do not mean that somebody else should give you everything that you want on a plate. I'm just saying that it's super nice when they do. And that if they have the ability to do it, and they're, they're by definition probably better at giving you their result than you are at getting it from them, then it seems reasonable to ask them to go a little further. Now, in the open source world, it's kind of hard to talk people into going a little further. It kind of is. Not, not impossible, but it's kind of hard. It's like, they, I don't get paid for this. You know, here's, here's all the steps. Knock yourself out. I get that. I'm not saying that, I'm not telling you to go back and, and you know, rebuild orchestration around your very complicated API that you had to meticulously pick out over five years worth of work. But now you've, you've, you've actually increased the pain in the world a little bit by asking people to use it. That doesn't make you a bad person, but you could have been a better person. Now, at the example stuff, I know you have examples in your, in your API, for your API. I know you do. Everybody does. You wrote a little bit of documentation. If for nothing else, then for the guy that, you, that came along next to you and said, hey, I want to work on this with you, and you went, awesome. Here's how you do it. You know, maybe it's 11 lines of text. You got examples, but your examples are of the hello world of your product almost always. They rarely dive into the depths of the application. I, uh, I really like a tool that was purchased by Red Hat several years ago called Fuse. Does anybody know who that is? It's an o it's a OSGI container and ActiveMQ server and camel routing and all kinds of cool, cool stuff in the back end. I really like this tool. I really like this tool because I like OSGI. And OSGI is a giant pain in the butt, but I really like the way this tool works. And I have had an enormous amount of trouble getting this tool to work correctly because the, all the examples for this tool that were available on the interwebs when I was starting to use it worked like a champ. You could, you know, hack together an OSGI bundle and throw it into the, into the Felix or Carafe, whichever one you were using, and crank it up and it would show you examples. I actually even did a, I did a two hour demo on using the thing by hacking the examples that I had. And they did real work. But that's about as far as I really ever get with it most of the time. Not anymore, I'm, I've, I've, spent, I've put a little time into it. But in the beginning, it was terrible. And I couldn't really get a lot of help with that because the developer list was less than completely responsive and the user list was not responsive at all under most circumstances. And my, and my problem was substantial because I was trying to do a bunch of big work using this tool that I knew it would do. Now, that they had lots of the hello world examples, but they didn't tell me how to actually build the, how to dive all the way down 
and build the pieces at the bottom of the chain that I really needed to use. They do now, now that they charge a jillion dollars to people to consult from Red Hat, and I'm cool with that. That's, that's a great way to make money, it really is. But I really would have liked to have been more of a, I'd like to have been more of a, an evangelist for them because I know they have an awesome product, they just kind of lacked at the example level. Give me real stuff that does real work. Don't do it all for me. I mean, you don't know my use case, really, but make your use case at least be encompassing of a number of a variety of situations. Ones that solve real, real, real problems. Go, you know, read data, whatever it is, you know, whatever your thing is, whatever the thing you might be able to produce is. Divide, you know, divide your results into examples that are for people who are not good at stuff and for people who are good at stuff. Get, graduate the results. Build on your documentation this way. Then you get to have something that looks a little bit more like this. People can see through what they can see outside of what their life looks like into what you want them to see, the thing that they're looking for. Any questions? Comments? I told you it was going to go kind of fast. How about that? So if you, divide, if you add up both of my presentations, it was really only 45 minutes apiece. Okay, no questions? Good. Oh, damn it. <laughs> what? Ramble? Uh, no. Oh, yeah, 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 I've heard of this. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, so. There is a mechanism for, I didn't, I didn't actually include this because I, wasn't, I couldn't remember the name of it. There are tools that let you do documentation on your API and even publish them in, in public places. But those tools are themselves things that you have to learn how to use. In my world, that tool should come with like a babysitter. There should, I mean like you can find me a dude. Like that you should really kind of pull everybody into the fold on that one. They have a, have a building system around which people who become capable of, do, of documenting their APIs correctly. I am not that guy. I don't, I'm not a people person. But I like the idea that there are people persons in the world who are capable of disseminating that kind of, that kind of behavior. Yep. Yep. Uh, some of us learn better by example. Sure. You suck. That we can emulate. No. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm willing to take them, by the way, if you have them. I am totally, if you think yours is awesome, like, I, I have to say this. I mean, I'm like, I'm not really kiss Rich. I like Richard a lot. I'm not kissing his ass. This code's actually got a pretty good API to it. Because it's super simple. I mean, it does the one thing it's supposed to do. Who you got? Twilio. Actually, you're right. Twilio does have a really good API. They do. Right. So I will say this. Um, I actually really like the documentation for Git. I'm not a, once again, I've said this before, I'm not a Git guy. I don't like Git. It's just the one everybody uses and the one that pretty much people are going to continue to use, and it does all the stuff. It really does work. And their API for the way you interface to Git is incredibly complicated. But it's graduated. You can actually start at the crappy end and walk your way up. You can do this. It's the same for Fossil. I, I actually used Fossil for a project um, a few months ago. I mean, I. I, Richard writes Fossil too, by the way. But Fossil is a, is a decentralized uh, source code control system as well that happens to use SQLite in the back end. I know that's a huge shock for everybody. <laughs> but it actually works a lot. Uh, it works very well. And having, you know, having, it, having uh, constraints on what you're willing to do, not trying to shotgun the problem, actually helps that an awful lot. Yes, sir. SQL Alchemy? I don't necessarily agree with that. 
But I, but I do like, I like SQL, Al I use SQL Alchemy an awful lot, but I don't know if I remember whether or not it was easy to learn because I've been using it a little too much. Hmm? But it's complicated, but the there's plenty of documentation. There is a lot of documentation for it. Yes, there are, and they, actually there are not just examples. The best thing about most open source APIs is not the documentation that you get with the tool. The fact that you get Michael Bayer on email in 20 minutes. Well, yeah, that's helpful. <laughs> But the, the, but the fact that you can actually go to other projects that are open source projects that are using that code and steal their codes. I don't know, no, y'all don't ever do that. Y'all are really smart. You make your stuff off by, by hand. But I totally cannibalize everything I've ever seen in the world. I'm not sure if I've ever written an original line of code or not. Because I look, but I, and that's, back, that's actually how I learned to use SQL Alchemy. Is not necessarily, I'm pretty sure it wasn't sitting down and hacking through the documentation. I think I found the book for it, well there was a, there was a book for it, but I got a book for it like way later. So it was, I went and hacked up applications that used SQL Alchemy internally and was like, how does, well, I don't know how this application works, but here's the part where they're doing the, they're getting the cursor for that. Okay, I got it now. So that sort of thing is, uh, is how I do this. To, to again, to answer your question, no, I, I really don't. I don't have things that I would pony up and say, this is the way to do it. But I'm not gonna do that anyway. I mean, I, I know I kicked around OAuth a lot, but the truth is that OAuth is, is kind of a comprehensive authorization and uh, identity management holder. It really is. You could make it do more stuff. You could make it do it easier um, but it does pretty much everything that it sets out to do. But it's super complicated. And if you have a super complicated problem, you probably do have a super complicated API. But what I think we miss in software development is not the fact that you have a super complicated problem that you're trying to solve, but that not everybody's iteration of that problem needs to have the access to all the things, to all the stuff you're gonna do. I didn't, start, I didn't start writing Java by cracking open the, uh, the, the networking code. I just, well, I guess there really technically wasn't networking code then, but I didn't start writing, writing Java by write, cracking open the, the new network libraries. I, I understood pieces of it very, very slowly. And maybe you're smarter than me. Well, probably you're smarter than me. But the truth is that I think lots of people work really well when you can give them success at lower levels and graduate that set success into more complex, uh, complex compositions of success. Anybody else? Awesome, thanks for your time. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process.
the agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.